Animals podcast brings you weekly episodes about surprising, mysterious, or just plain strange animals. From jellyfish to dragons, tune in to discover your new favorite animal. Find us at strangeanimalspodcast.com or download us through your favorite podcast app. Hello and welcome to this episode of Physical Attraction. Today I'm going to be talking about some of the issues surrounding artificial intelligence, specifically motivated by the release of a fairly new 100-page report from academics at the Future of Humanity Institute and the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. The report is about potential malicious uses for AI and machine learning technologies, so it doesn't relate to the more speculative futures where superintelligent AI arises that completely transforms the world overnight, with uncertain consequences of course. This is more about the technologies that are currently around us, or that might foreseeably arise in the next 5-10 to ten years, and how they could be abused. And it's important to point out that you don't necessarily need to have something designed to be malicious, something designed to cause harm, for it to cause quite considerable societal damage at the end of the day. Even just the fact that these mechanisms for these technologies are opaque makes a world where people don't question algorithms, or where the algorithms don't just give advice but actually execute decisions, all the more terrifying. Imagine a test has been devised that can identify criminal activity online with 99.9% accuracy. It might sound good enough to a politician or business executive, but any statistician will tell you that if you apply that to a million people, you'll expect a thousand false positives. If you're carted away and you protest your innocence saying you didn't do anything, they'll say, really? The algorithm is 99.9% accurate, and they will view that, in your case, as there being a one in a thousand chance that you are in fact innocent. Well, who knows? You could be. We've already discussed how employment algorithms can systematically discriminate against people if they've been trained on historical data. You know, we've never had a female CEO, so why have one now? Applying for jobs in this economy is incredibly difficult. Many perfectly well-qualified people apply for dozens or even hundreds of jobs and receive nothing but rejections. It could be that this decision is being made by an algorithm. The first screening stage is often an algorithm that reads your CV, and presumably decides whether or not to pass it on to a human. I even read just the other day, in order to get their CVs through the algorithm filters, graduate advisors are telling people to hide the words Oxford or Cambridge in their CV in invisible white text, presumably to boost their score past some arbitrary threshold that gets their CV to be reviewed by an actual person. Now if the company actually had to say, oh, we just throw away all the CVs that don't have Oxford or Cambridge in them. They might get in trouble for being elitist. It might at least save potential employees from wasting their time. Instead, they can say, we have algorithmic pre-hire screening, like everyone else. And you have no idea if it's inferring your IQ from your writing style, or just choosing the faces that look the most like Natalie Dormer. Anyone like me, for instance, who's applied for a job recently will know that the effort to automate as much of the application process as possible has meant that there are dozens of hurdles to jump through. Tests, personality quizzes, and even in some new cases, dialogue with a chatbot. Faithful listeners will recall from the Seduced by a Robot episode that chatbots, while often intriguing and perhaps even occasionally useful, often flatter to deceive in terms of their intelligence. I would not want to be judged by one. There are plenty of startups caught in the dash to exploit the powers of AI to come up with insights that humans can't even though interpreting those insights is really a job for humans. Take HireVue, who are using a piece of software that interprets people's, quote, verbal and non-verbal cues, and compares them to existing, high-performing employees. Quote, Mondragon is head psychologist at HireVue, which markets software for screening job candidates. Its flagship product, which is used by Unilever and Goldman Sachs, asks candidates to answer their interview questions in front of a camera. Meanwhile, its software, like a team of hawk-eyed psychologists hiding behind a mirror, takes note of barely perceptible changes in posture, facial expression, and vocal tone. We break the answers people give down into many thousands of data points, into verbal and non-verbal cues, says Mondragon. If you're answering a question about how you would spend a million dollars, your eyes would tend to shift upwards, your verbal cues would go silent, your head would tilt slightly upward with your eyes. 
The program turns this data into a score, which is then compared against one that the program has already learned from top performing employees. The idea is that a good prospective employee looks a lot like a good current employee, just not in any way a human interviewer would notice. Approaches like vocal analysis and reading these micro-expressions have been applied in policing and intelligence with little clear success, but Mondragon says automated analyses compare favourably with established tests of personality and ability, and that customers report better employee performance and less turnover. HireVue is just one of a new slew of companies selling AI as a replacement for the costly human side of hiring. It estimates the pre-hire assessment market is worth $3 billion a year. End quote. In this brave new world, then, you as the job hunter don't even have the right to talk to a human or get an explanation for why you weren't hired. Perhaps they sent an AI to trawl through data associated with you on the internet or in databases, and you didn't match the personality profile of an ideal employee. Perhaps that bot made a mistake, but you'll never know. Or you'll ever get as a standard rejection letter, often instantaneous, with no idea what you did wrong and no guidance on how to improve. In many cases, and this is the key thing, I don't think that there is a problem with companies trying to filter down people in the first stage of applications. If you have thousands of applications, it's not realistic to expect a human to look through all of them. But in many cases, the explanations do not exist. No one can give you a reason why you weren't hired. The explanation is just a number in a spreadsheet spun by an algorithm. The algorithm cannot tell you how it came up with that number. Let's leave aside the effort that this shifts from employer to potential employee. If you're an employer, are you really getting the best candidates from an algorithm that uses shaky science like analysing micro cues and ensures that the people you hire are just like the people you already have, according to their psychometric test scores? Is that what you really want? And if your pre-hire screening process with no human oversight is giving you bad candidates or missing out good ones, how can you remedy that? How would you even know? What if people learn how to game the system, cheat the algorithm with a sort of human version of adversarial examples where they mimic an ideal performance? Then the system rewards cheats. Of course, in some lines of work, you might call that resourcefulness. But it's not that you don't know why the machine has made the decision, there's no transparency to the decision, and you can't tell the job applicant what they did wrong. Unscrupulous people or hackers could manipulate the decisions that are made, and you might find it impossible to know. Maybe you're thinking now that eh, companies can do what they want to hire people. And some people do make the valid point that you can be discriminated against just as easily by a human, and possibly for even worse reasons. People involved in the hiring process might be more discriminatory than the algorithms, although I'd argue that it's hard to tell, and the fact that the algorithm's decisions are cloaked in this black box magic makes it difficult to assess or interrogate. But we know, of course, that people are racist, misogynistic, and discriminate against those with disabilities, even if they don't consciously think that they do, whereas an algorithm might not. Or it might. But besides, the way things are set up at the moment, this is really a terrible argument, since the AI is just a pre-screening process before you speak to a human interviewer. So at the moment, you're judged by a machine and then a person. Hardly makes the problem any better. And this dovetails badly with the future of work too, because many people view a future that's more dominated by algorithms as being one where there are fewer permanent jobs, more freelance work and more of the gig economy people's career trajectories will be different. Maybe there will be more fixed-term contracts for a few years or months. You'll need to learn new skills and shift around in your career a lot to deal with the industries that are being automated out from under you. In which case, you could be subject to this kind of hiring process many, many more times, competing against many more people. One of the things that particularly worries me about this biometric cue thing is that some people do have different effect to others. Like, if you're someone who's autistic, you will have a different set of facial expressions, a different set of non-verbal cues, and depending on the job, that could match with the people who are working at that company already or not. If you're a particularly gregarious computer programmer compared to the people who work at your computer programming job that you're applying for, or if you're a particularly introverted but not necessarily bad at your job banker, you can see that this kind of discrimination is, is not a good thing. Why is it, again, that you want to have employees that are the same as the ones you already have employed? Even so, you may join the people who think that robots and algorithms can be better than people at hiring, that people are more prone to bias. But the real AI enthusiasts are talking about AI being used to make all kinds of decisions. 
your loan application, your mortgage application, getting into schools, heck, even getting into or out of jail. These algorithms are being used to determine people's bail conditions in the US. China is even looking to develop a social credit score, whereby the people who the algorithm deems to be good citizens are favoured by the government, and those who are deemed to be likely criminals are watched or even arrested. Imagine being told that your healthcare wasn't prioritised because an algorithm had decided you weren't a good citizen. Imagine being arrested without an explanation. You might not even know that the algorithm was behind the decision, and trying to figure out how those numbers that it comes up with translates to actual things that you've done could be very, very opaque. Kafka.ai What can you do if you think you've been discriminated against by such an algorithm? Until recently, the answer was nothing. But there have lately been some court cases that will hopefully establish legal precedents. Weapons of Maths Destruction by Cathy O'Neill is a good book to read on this topic. Don't blame the algorithms. As Eliza Yudkowsky said, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. They know not how to figure out what they do. They know not that it is important that they figure out what they do. They were not raised to believe that there is a moral dimension to thinking clearly about what they do. So blame the people who know these limitations and still use them in an indiscriminate way. Of course, all the discussion about algorithms is before you get into the truly nightmarish territory of killer robots. Not the Terminator, but instead autonomous or consumer drones, which could potentially be weaponized by bad actors and used to conduct attacks remotely. Some reports have indicated that terrorist organizations are already trying to do this. There have been reports from the Middle East of crude, remotely piloted drones that have had improvised explosive devices and things attached to them. And if autonomous drones become more widely available, then naturally you think the problem would get even worse. Towards the end of 2017, a pressure group produced a terrifying campaign video. Deciding not to pull any punches, they called it Slaughterbots. The group, the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots, is pretty clear about their aims. They want autonomous weapons to be treated in the same way as chemical and biological agents, and put under the same controls, the same bans. And if you take the claims in the video at face value, you can see why. While it might be difficult to imagine a killer humanoid robot due to difficulties in their development, and anyone who's ever seen RoboCup, the competition where the robots play football, can imagine that it might be easy enough to outrun or outwit those robots as they are at the moment. Slaughterbots imagines a much more realistic scenario. It just asks you to imagine a palm-sized drone equipped with facial recognition software, which probably already exists on your phone, and three grams of plastic explosives. Once released, it's a perfect killing machine. It navigates to the target's forehead and detonates, instantly destroying the brain. Nuclear is obsolete, crows the salesman in the video, as fleets of killer drones are dropped from airplanes. Slaughterbots then feels the need to contrive a story about terrorists getting their hands on the weapons and using the targeting software to kill government personnel. You may already be horrified by the prospect of governments obtaining the power to indiscriminately kill. Before long, these horrifying murderous attacks are being perpetrated by virtually everyone. The last sound that many hear is the whine of the drones, followed by a short, sharp bang. Slaughterbots is a piece of propaganda designed to provoke a debate. It doesn't necessarily make realistic predictions about the most feasible technological future that we have. As such, you should take it with some massive grains of salt. Of course, this microdrone technology may be a long way from reality. But it hits the keynotes of concerns over the future of weapon systems admirably. Don't worry about terminators, but small, mass-produced killing machines. The war on terror provides a huge incentive to produce systems that can target individuals in a more discriminatory way. We've already had this debate about the drone war that's going on in the Middle East at the moment, and how it disproportionately seems to target civilians as well as combatants. And there is obviously a huge incentive for both the military and law enforcement regimes from oppressive states to develop a system that could target individuals in a highly specialised way, using facial recognition and things like that. Slaughterbots, as this propaganda piece, was designed with a particular UN summit in mind, but in November that summit failed to enact a ban and instead simply agreed to carry on discussions about autonomous weapons. Of course you can find other points of view on this topic. 
Paul Shah, who worked for the US DOD, is the author of a book about autonomous weapons, and he finds this scenario very implausible. He claims that governments aren't working on robots that would target individual civilians, but instead autonomous weapons for the battlefield. He also points out that there are plenty of countermeasures one could take against such micro-drones, including something as simple as a robot mosquito net. Combine this with Paul's view that it's unlikely that terrorists would be able to obtain this many military-grade drones and launch them in coordinated attacks on the scale depicted in the video, and he's willing to decry the video as unnecessarily scaremongering. As ever, the reality lies somewhere between the extremes. Paul Shah is a weapons expert, and I am not, so I don't want to completely destroy his argument in any way, and I don't think that I do. And while you might not be able to go to your local supervillain store and purchase 100 drones to target your 100 least favourite people anytime soon, the idea of terrorists or other bad actors using DIY drones loaded with explosives for assassinations or small-scale attacks is a real concern because it's already happened. In a more elaborate scenario, they would be the ultimate method of control for an authoritarian state to deploy. Your countermeasures may be able to thin the swarm, but if it's cheap enough to produce them, you could find yourself trying to stop dozens if not hundreds of drones with the same target. Shah notes that in the real world, people respond to threats from new types of weapons with countermeasures. On this occasion, he may be right, but it really doesn't always follow that this is the case. Have we yet developed effective countermeasures for nuclear weapons? No, we have not. Missile defence systems do not work to reliably deter nuclear threats. Instead, there's just a deterrence factor, whereby people hope that these kind of weapons won't be used by other authorities because it will lead to an escalation and there's a mutually assured destruction component to things. But the very nature of these micro-weapons, these drones that could be designed, is that they are perfect for asymmetric warfare and terror attacks in a way that a nuclear weapon, which you have far fewer of and it's far more difficult to create one, aren't. Have we developed an effective countermeasure for a release of the smallpox virus? No, we just rely on the fact that not many people have got a hold of it. But in the next few years, it might be possible for people to synthetically revive it. And we've seen this in the case with the horsepox virus that we talked about in our supervirus episodes. So the creation of such micro-drone weapons, or micro-drones that are autonomous that could be easily adapted into weapons, it might not automatically lead to a hellish slaughterbots dystopia, but it certainly could increase all kinds of risks for all of us. Let's not forget, these drones are an asymmetric form of warfare. Shah points out that you can stop the slaughterbots drones with something as simple as wire mesh netting, unless, of course, they can cut through it. When phrased like that, the asymmetry seems to favour the defender. You can stop the Daleks with a flight of stairs, but of course you need to ensure that every potential target is equally armed. One autonomous or remote-controlled weaponized drone could attack virtually any building. Drone-proofing every potential target shifts the costs back towards the defenders again. It might be feasible to do this for military bases and airports, but it's hardly a perfect solution. The question, though, is what are we going to do about it? Many of the pressure groups involved are calling for a total ban on autonomous weapons, and a requirement that humans should always be in the loop, piloting the thing, if it has the capacity to deploy force. But of course, banning a technology does not prevent bad actors from pursuing it. It might be difficult to prevent an arms race if the advantages of autonomy become too great, and it wouldn't stop DIY terror attacks from small groups. The real problem here is that the enabling technology for the killer micro-drones is mostly in the software and hardware for a machine that can autonomously navigate and find a target, so it's difficult to ban the type of robot that Slaughterbots predicts. After all, take out that 3 grams of explosive, and a robot that can fly around by itself and recognise people is just the must-have gadget, the must-have toy of 2019, right? It's usually possible to tell if someone's building a nuclear bomb, but a drone that could be a fairly innocuous toy could only need minor modifications to be weaponized. And more than a million drones were sold in the US in the last two years, so the cat's kind of out of the bag on this one. It's going to be hard to ban them. I've been to a few sports matches where either hobbyists or TV crews operate drones that are flying overhead, and I can't help but think about how easy it might be to crash that thing into the crowd if you were so inclined. If anything, the most difficult step in the process could well be getting access to the explosives or setting up the payload, which thankfully is often a point at which terrorist plots fail. 
but it needn't be forever. The AI report, the malicious AI report, has a rather chilling scenario set in the near future. Autonomous cleaning robots have become so routine that they're almost invisible. No one pays them any mind. In the Houses of Parliament, one day, a cleaning robot goes rogue and heads for a government minister before detonating a concealed bomb. If robots are everywhere, and one of them is hijacked and tampered with, it could prove difficult to stop the attack or even find out who was ultimately behind it. And who's to say they'd stop with one if all robots of a certain kind are vulnerable? Even if you view a slaughterbot scenario as completely implausible, and it may well be, the moral and ethical concerns of automated killings won't go away. Already people have discussed how killing with human-operated drone strikes is resulting in widespread civilian casualties when the autonomous systems go wrong. The process of killing in war is already becoming more automatic, even if it's not fully automated. Drones have been legitimised and normalised as a weapon of war by the US government. Is it really such a huge step from remote control to fully automatic? And as AI begins to dominate more and more of our lives, that step is going to look smaller and smaller. For people who think that this scenario where a new potentially dangerous technology, a biotechnology, an AI technology, robotics, whatever, is developed, and an arms race means that one side eventually unilaterally deploys it, leading to political instability, some people might think that scenario isn't realistic. But for me, drones is a case in point, right? The US government were the first to have unmanned aerial vehicles, and they basically deployed them wherever they felt like it. There was no talk about, we're the only ones who have this weapon, so let's make sure that no one else can use it, and let's put a ban on it, a moratorium on developing it, anything like that. It seems like the first people to develop a weapon of war will probably view it as a legitimate weapon of war. It's very difficult to say, based on precedent, that anyone is going to say, well, we've developed this super-intelligent AI system that can hack into your infrastructure and completely control it, but we're going to just destroy it and never use it because it's too dangerous. It's the kind of thing that doesn't happen that much. I'm sure some of you are fans of social media. On Twitter, you can't go anywhere or express any opinion without being accused of being a bot by someone or other. With the Russian hacking allegations and propaganda campaign, there's just enough in the news for people to think that this is realistic. As far as Facebook and Twitter go, the companies are in a bind. They're hamstrung by their advertising model. Either they have to admit how much bot traffic is on their platforms and risk a massive dip in the share price when it's revealed that most of those ad clicks you get aren't real people, or they have to ignore the problem or accept the consequences of all of these automated users. In the case of the Russian influence campaign, Facebook is in the awkward position of simultaneously telling the world that its adverts made no difference to the election outcome, while also telling advertisers that Facebook adverts can change consumer behaviour. It's a catch-22. Yet, at least at the moment, most of the people being accused of bots aren't AI. They might be paid trolls like the Russians use, but only the most basic ones seem like they could be fully automated. This is part of a wider phenomenon. People aren't always best placed to see how far AI has progressed. It develops so quickly that you really can't keep up with it. You can see this by looking at the popularity of robots like Sophia, or others developed by Hanson Robotics. If YouTube comments and social media buzz are anything to go by, a fraction of the audience is convinced that we already have sentient artificial intelligence. Is it any wonder, when the field is so opaque and when it's so full of hype, which I admit I kind of do contribute to here, that people believe that this thing might exist? People can say reasonable things or perform reasonable experiments, which then go viral quoted out of context and lead to confusion about what AI can really do. And as in the case of deepfakes, I think it's difficult to put that kind of perception back in the box. And I don't think I could reliably tell you if something is possible with AI or not. It seems likely to me that most of the time, when someone calls someone else a bot, they're overestimating the capacity of AI to engage in realistic dialogue. But can I really be 100% sure about that when the technology evolves so quickly? There are plenty of bots to go around, but I doubt they could engage you in extended conversation, given the extensive limitations of chatbots we talked about in Seduced by a Robot. But it's an obvious point, part of being fooled is that you never realise you were fooled. As with deepfakes, as with autonomous drones, as with spearfishing, doesn't it change society if people think that these things are possible? even if they're actually some way off. Another aspect that they highlight in the report is something that will be familiar to listeners of our episodes about nuclear weapons. 
Remember when we talked about that old naval officer's idea to prevent nuclear war from ever taking place? Store the nuclear codes next to the heart of a volunteer? If the president ever wants to launch the missiles, he must stab someone to death in order to do it. The psychology of attacking someone with a knife is much more difficult for most people to justify than coldly mechanically pressing a button or reading out a code, even if the knife kills one or the code kills a hundred million. Similarly, by increasing the psychological distance between the attacker and the victim, AI and cyber weapons, as well as autonomous weapons like drones, can make people who otherwise wouldn't carry out attacks do so. It can make people willing to do things they wouldn't consider otherwise, and this is what they flag up in the report. Maybe you're not fanatical enough to physically steal someone's wallet or go and shoot a total stranger, but if you can do it from your room with a PlayStation controller, it might be a different story. Or, let's put it another, more relatable way. You might not steal a DVD, or steal a CD, but would you download a film from online without paying for it? There are some positive recommendations that come out of the malicious AI report. Most of them concern increasing collaboration between policymakers and AI experts. And it's well known that cybersecurity experts, by getting into the mindset of hackers, can identify and exploit vulnerabilities in their own software. With careful regulation of media companies like Twitter, Facebook and Reddit, all of which need to accept their own responsibility to filter out fake, misleading or malicious content, there's hope that the worst of the ill effects can be limited. Autonomous drones, the associated hardware and software, can to a degree be controlled at the original source, the manufacturers, who need to build in as many safety features as possible to prevent tampering. Ultimately though, a lot of the concern over this is that things are going to be driven by market competition. If you're in a race against time with 15 other startups to produce the first drone-based delivery service, or the first use of AI algorithms for some new application, that huge first mover advantage is a disadvantage for security. Good security takes time, and you can see that there'll be an incentive for people to cut corners if they're not held accountable when security vulnerabilities exist. On the consumer side, they recommend a browser plugin called Who Targets Me, which will enable you to see who's buying political adverts for you on Facebook and Twitter. But on the whole, the report writers seem to despair a little bit at public awareness being the best tool at combating these kinds of threats and attacks. After all, the public has been widely made aware of scams like pyramid schemes and Ponzi schemes, where investment opportunities are too good to be true. People have widely been told not to visit dodgy websites, to patch their software regularly, to take cybersecurity seriously, and so on and so forth. But there are enough people, and I suppose ultimately we're easy enough to manipulate, that there will always be some victims. Equally, you can't expect people to understand and combat the intricacies of every threat. Most of us just want to install our software and be done with it. Controlling things at the source is an easier step of countermeasures for policymakers. After all, plenty of vulnerable people might fall for a spam email, but they won't if it's automatically filtered into junk by Google's algorithm. You might balk at the prospect of consumers becoming even more dependent on the big tech companies to safely browse the internet, but equally they might end up being the only ones with the resources that can reliably handle the threats. Good corporate governance is therefore essential, and aren't we seeing a lack of that at the moment? We need to foster a sense of responsibility amongst the people who research this stuff, at least according to the Malicious AI report. Tech giants will have limits to their cooperation, though. They want to get their product out quickly, they want it to be the best, and what's more, they're not exactly incentivized to be open with their proprietary algorithms. The value of so many of these companies doesn't rest in physical property anymore. There aren't any manufacturing facilities and the like. Instead, it's more nebulous concepts. Brand identity, yes. User engagement, yes, but also the thousands of lines of code and the masses of data that they collect. Without these very private, secure assets, the companies are worth a lot less, so they're bound to keep them secret to an extent. And being open with your algorithms and data can also make it more likely that the wrong people get their hands on it and figure out how to fool it. As with any technology, when new abilities come with new risks, that's just a given. And as with any form of technology, closing Pandora's box will prove difficult, if not impossible. It seems that in the short term at least, in that chaotic period when a new technology is developed, but before things adjust to a more safe equilibrium, we'll probably see a lot of bad actors getting involved. Arguably, we've seen the same thing already with cryptocurrencies recently, which have become a magnet for scammers and Ponzi schemes before people have started to regulate them a little bit more. 
The same may well be true of new AI capabilities, and the authors of the report suggest that attacks will probably happen with increasing intensity and frequency for the next few years, until consistent ways of governing AI research and deployment are established, and people can deploy it in defensive capabilities as well. Ultimately, the arms race between hackers and security experts may well end up taking place one further level of abstraction away from reality. Now it will be a battle of algorithms between automated systems that can exploit vulnerabilities and automated systems that can patch them. There are some risks that run across most uses of AI. It seems likely that there's no way to ensure your machine is connected to other machines or the outside world without opening up a small risk that someone will exploit that connection for bad purposes. And the black box nature of algorithms, the fact that a computer and a neural network especially cannot by default explain why it's made a decision, means that if you trust them too much, you can get into trouble. Maybe it's being fooled by an adversarial example. Perhaps it's encoding biases and unfairness into the system because the data that it's fed has been biased or poisoned. Or perhaps it's making decisions by some logic, but not for the logic you'd like it to use. Logic that you might find terrible if you knew about it. Being lulled into a false sense of security by something that seems to be superhuman, but is still fallible, could lead to terrible consequences. Somewhere in between the excessively hyped prospects of AI that will do everything for us, and AI that will instantly destroy the world, lies the reality. A complex, ever-changing set of risks and rewards that we desperately need to understand with expertise and study. The writers of the Malicious AI report note that one of the key motivations is ensuring that the benefits of new technology can be delivered to people as quickly but as safely as possible. The issue is that so much of technology is dual purpose, it can be used for good or evil, and we need to figure out how to minimise the risks. You can ban people from inventing Terminator-style robots that are designed only for killing humans. But a, con a benign consumer drone that's supposed to deliver shopping, like the Amazon drones, or even help people in emergency situations by flying to them and recognising their faces, could become a deadly weapon with minor modifications. It's not always going to be possible to divorce good AI from bad AI, but in this relentlessly progressing world, the idea of becoming Luddites and banning certain types of technological progress doesn't seem like it would work if it was even a good idea. The AI presents challenges that will be different in kind. If someone develops a new type of weapon, it takes time to construct and build them. You can shut off their supplies to physical materials, raid the factories. If someone develops a malicious AI, it can spread at the speed of light, multiply exponentially, limited only by computing power, scale up to attack thousands of people simultaneously. It takes us back to the Teot Wauki specials. Like it or not, we're always in a race against time with this stuff. In the rush to exploit the potential for AI algorithms and create 21st century infrastructure, we must ensure we're not building in new pitfall traps for ourselves. Thank you for listening to this episode of Physical Attraction, which was pretty much just a rant about the malicious AI report and all of the comments, questions, concerns and things that come out of this strange new world of narrow AI, before we even get into the crazy stuff that could happen if we have super intelligent AI. But I'm sure you've got lots of thoughts on this topic, so why don't you email us? You can go to www.physicspodcast.com. There you can download every episode of the show that's been released so far. You can listen to them all. You can donate to us via the PayPal link. You can subscribe to our Patreon if you want to support the work that we do. And there's a comments form. There's a contact us form. I read all of those emails and respond to the ones that make sense. So <laughs> you're perfectly welcome. And I would be very, very happy if you would send me feedback, questions, comments, what you want the next episode to be on, where I said something that was insanely wrong. And, you know, if it's interesting and if you bring up interesting points and stuff worth discussing, there could be an episode just based on listener questions. I've always wanted to do that. So until next time, the things you should do, Twitter, Physics Pod, we've got a Facebook page, Physical Attraction. You can review us on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts, but the best thing is just to tell other people to listen if you've enjoyed the show. That way we keep growing and we can spread the word and have a bigger, more inclusive discussion, I guess. Until next time, then, take care of yourself.